I am clearly not Mike. Uh, if, if anybody was confused, let me, let me square all that up right now. And uh, most of you who know me know me as uh, an attorney. Uh, there was actually at one point in my life where I actually trained as a uh, pastor, although we didn't call it that. Uh, I'm going to break a lot of rules this morning of what I was trained in. I uh, wasn't trained to preach in jeans. I wasn't trained certainly to preach barefoot. Uh, if anybody has a question about that, you can ask me later. Uh, but then also wasn't taught to uh, do much of anything else that we do here. So I'm going to break all sorts of rules. Um, the, my, uh, that's called homiletics for those academics of you. So my homiletics teachers uh, uh, will not be happy today, but that's okay uh, because this is where God has brought me to. So this morning... We are going to continue in our discussion of Revelation. Revelation. Um, we are at a great point in the study uh, for, for me to touch on a few things. So I am not going to, per se, break any new ground in uh, the book of Revelation. What I'm going to do is we're going to do a, a bit of a, of a recap, and then we're going to look forward because there are some keys to understanding this type of literature, okay? If, if you've really not studied this type, it's, it's very different from just picking up the Bible and reading in the book of Matthew or reading in the book of Acts or something like that. Can anybody tell me uh, any other books in the Bible that are very similar to the book of Revelation? Anyone? Yes. Daniel parts of Isaiah, parts of Ezekiel, so we'll get to that in a minute. Now, here comes the part where we decide whether or not the technology is working today. Oh, look, it's quiz time. <laughs> I know that there's some of you who are really looking forward to this. You know, or some of you that would be disappointed if we didn't do this. So, what book are we studying? B. B? What's B? Revelation. You sure we're not studying A? Does anybody not know what C is? If you don't know what C is, talk to me, because it's also apocalyptic as well, just a little different. So, Revelation. Who wrote Revelation? John the Baptist? John the Apostle? Elton John? You know, a better test writer would probably pick a different answer than B. John the Apostle. Why do we know this? Can anybody tell me? Does he, does he declare himself as John the Apostle in the text? No, he does not. How, did he, how, does, he, how does he identify himself? He's John of Patmos. Okay? So he doesn't identify himself as John the Apostle. There are some critics who have issue with it being uh, John the Apostle, and there's some reason why they have those criticisms. But uh, for me, as many of you know, being an attorney... Uh, right here, we have some of the early witnesses, some of the early historians. Uh, the first century church knew it. this is John the Apostle. And so those are the people closest to when it was written, right? Doesn't it make sense that we listen to them? Okay. So John the Apostle, he also had a relationship with these churches. And there were plenty of other churches in the area. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. All right. This might be a tough one. How many major sections are there in the book of Revelation? Are there one? Four? Twenty-two? You know, there's kind of a pattern there, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I said, I sure, uh, they're not going to call, they're not going to call on me to write the bar exam anytime soon. So, four. So, true for A, it is one revelation, not revelations, not multiple. And there are 22 chapters, but did John write 22 chapters in there? Yeah, that came later. So four major sections. So we have uh, the, the seven churches. That's what we just went through, and we're going to do just a real quick review on that. We also have uh, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven plagues. Okay? And one trick to this that we're going to get to is it's real easy for us to go through the book of Revelation and think, okay... Well, as this unfolds, we're going to have seven seals that open first, 
then we're going to have seven trumpets, and then we're going to have seven plagues. Okay? But it's not written that way. So you're welcome to think that it's supposed to unfold that way, and God is certainly able to do that. But typically in the way this is written, it's not written what's called chronologically. All right. Can anybody tell me what type of writing Revelation is? Is it an epistle? Is it apocalypse? Is it a prophecy? <laughs> well, you're sort of right. It's all three. Epistle means it's a letter, okay? So it was written to seven churches. An apocalypse is the writing style, and we're going to get into that, and that's really the heart of this message. And it's also a prophecy, just like we talked about, similar to Daniel, parts of Isaiah, Isaiah, parts of Ezekiel. So, why that answer? It's actually a circular letter, so it's written to seven churches. You can actually see the, see the map on that. It's prophetic. It speaks of what the church has to come. And then it's an apocalyptic writing. And I especially like this. Symbolic, figurative, and metaphoric language used to convey the writer's message. Why do we care? Is anybody choosing A? <laughs> or C? We care because it makes a lot of difference in the book. How many people have heard some really weird stuff from people teaching Revelation? Yes, right. You can get some really weird stuff out of it. You know, people saying they exactly know, you know, what the dragon is or what the beast is and that sort of thing. And, and chances are there's one of those for every age. So you really have to understand what's in the book. So in the first century church, especially the Jews, would have understood this as apocalypse literature. They knew this book to be similar, like we talked about, Ezekiel, Daniel, parts of Isaiah. And they knew that this wasn't like the Gospel of John. They knew this wasn't like 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. All right. So, like we said, we've covered seven churches. Can anybody rattle those off? That would be really cool. Okay, good. I can't either. Um, seven seals. So we're going to start that with Mike. You know, I could start that today, but I'd rather leave it for Mike. Besides, it's kind of challenging. The seven trumpets and then the seven plagues. So that's the four sections, okay? So as we're going through this, however long it takes, hang in there, but however long it takes, just remember what section are we in. We finished the churches, so we finished the first major section. We are, and we're going to have to balance this with Easter, but we're moving into the seals and then the trumpets and then the plagues. So, first church. We've already covered this. This is a real quick review. Ephesus. Um, Ephesus had some issues. Then Smyrna. Smyrna is one of the churches that had no strikes against them. There's two of those. Pergamum. Thyatira. Thyatira is the one that dealt with Jezebel, and Jezebel is most likely figurative name. Um, although it is sad in my practice, I have encountered a child that her parents did name her Jezebel. Yeah. Uh, I also had uh, two children, one named Cannabis and another one named Sativa. Some of y'all understand that. Uh, Sardis, suffering from apathy, a lot of what we see today. Uh, Philadelphia. No strikes. So that's the second one. And then Laodicea, the worst of the bunch. The lukewarm church. Okay? So, seven churches. Has anybody picked up on the, the use of the number seven yet? Has anybody seen, seen a, a kind of a common number there? We're going to get to that in a minute. And it is important to note that every one of these churches became a center for emperor worship. So do you remember as we talked about the different churches, several of them already had emperor worship as a part of it. Okay, do you remember that? By the time this letter is done and sent out, 
we find throughout history that they all become centers of, of emperor worship. So if you're struggling to find an answer to Revelation, you may just jump back to that. You may just jump back to the knowledge of the writer immediately is writing for what these churches are about to go through. Now, does it have application for us throughout the rest of time? Absolutely. But every one of these had to deal with emperor worship. Okay, section two. So this is what's to come. We've got a uh, white horse, we've got the red horse, we've got the black horse, we've got a lot of horses. Pale Rider, great movie. Then the martyrs cry out, we have a great earthquake, and then silence. So that's our next section. It's what's to come. On the trumpets, hail and fire mixed with blood, fiery mountain. You know, I really tried to do a cheerful sermon for this morning. <laughs> It's really not working. One third of heavenly bodies go dark. A fallen star. A voice proclaiming the release of... I haven't learned this pointer yet. Four. Seven thunders. Then the last section. A woman in labor. Fiery red dragon. If my eyes were better, I'd work off that one back there. The lamb with his people three angels, and a heavenly reaper. So that is the last of the four sections. Now, you know, obviously there's an introduction, there's a conclusion, there's things in the middle, but that's the four major sections. You remember talking about this? Can anybody tell me which type of writing it is? All three. All three, very good. So circular letter. It's an epistle, it's a letter, goes to the churches. Those readers would have easily understood this. You know, especially, you know, how many of these churches, they talk about the synagogue of Satan. They talk about the number of Jews that are interlaced with this. They understood apocalyptic literature. People who were new to Christ, people who were new to um, really the Jewish history and, and, and what that became through Christ had to catch up. But the Jews would have understood that. These lessons apply to us today. And... The choice of only seven churches was probably significant, as we will get into and discuss here very shortly. So, for the next two parts of this writing, apocalyptic and prophecy, normally they're run together. Okay? I don't know of any apocalypse writing that, that wasn't prophetic, that wasn't telling them things to come. Um, and typically, they came before very trying times. So... Uh, if, and if you ever want to do a neat study, uh, read Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and then jump to Revelation. It's kind of a theme study, but goes over what apocalyptic literature is. So we need to have a basic understanding of apocalyptic literature. So this is, this is where I, I really wanted to get to, because I think if... Has anybody been introduced to understanding apocalyptic literature before? Anybody? Is this a first for everybody in here? Awesome. Okay. Uh, as with any scripture, what's the first thing that we want to do? Right. Keep it in context. I am uh, always a little skittish of people who stick... Uh, with pinpoint Bible verses. Um, it's not that they're taking them out of context. It's just there's, there's, there's a chance of it. Now, uh, the guys who were with us Monday night have heard a bit of this, but I've got two resources that I wanted to share with you. Um, because I like to be able to get the background of a scripture, uh, the, the, the paper Bible that I carry with me, and that doesn't mean I don't access anything on my phone, uh, is the Zondervan Study Bible. This happens to be in NIV. The reason why I like this is if I'm in a situation where somebody gives me, you know, a pinpoint reference, I can take that and I can look at what the, the commentator says under that particular scripture. But then I can also back up to the first part of the book and I can, I can get a better understanding of really who wrote it, what kind of time that they were in. Now, some of these I can figure out. Some of these I already know. For example, if you, you know, somebody pulls a scripture out of Romans, 
Okay, it's written to the Romans. Got 